there's there's no way to say that the Quran as you have it today, it's exactly how the Prophet was reciting it. It is unique, but it is not miraculously unique. Yes, there are many grammatical inconsistencies in the Quran. If they were written by a person, by a poet, they would go after him. It's like, oh, this is wrong. You don't justify. But because it's the Quran, you have to justify. It cannot be wrong. Dr. Shadi Nasser, how are you doing? I'm, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to uh, meet you and not in person on, on screen. Uh, and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Yes. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that you uh, joined me. I'm very, very happy that you accepted. Sure, my no problem. Me too. No problem. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, could, could you very uh, briefly, for those who are not aware, uh, in a few words, uh, introduce yourself and your backgrounds? Uh, sure. I mean, very shortly, I uh, I teach uh, Arabic and Islamic studies at, at Harvard. I also mm -hmm. took uh, my PhD from there. And um, I mostly uh, teach and work on things related to, let's say, 7th, 8th century uh, Arabic language, including the Quran, transmission of texts, Arabic poetry. Um, so uh, that's uh, uh, shortly what, what I work on. Yeah. That is respectable. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay, so what I want to do today is I basically briefly talk to you about this uh, beforehand. I want to ask you uh, 10 questions that I um, designed for our quest today. I would like to hear your professional opinion in uh, short answers and long answers to these questions. You can let me know about the quality of these questions as we go. Uh, I, I want to ask you a clarification question before we start and then uh, uh, we'll see what uh, mm -hmm. where, where we can go from there. Sure. So um, our topic is the, is the Quran and how the Quran came into existence, the history and the authenticity of the Quran mm -hmm. and uh, related questions. So uh, the very first thing that I want to clarify before we get into our main questions uh, is I know this is not a work of uh, academia, but I want to ask this uh, question for the record just to uh, tackle a certain misconception that many people uh, may have, whether they come from a perspective of belief or disbelief in Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, is it possible for academics to professionally verify and conclude that the Quran is the word of Allah or the word of a God? No, <laughs> that's the short answer. Um, I, I don't think in, uh, in academia or in research, uh, researchers are interested in these questions. Of course, there are academics who are uh, Muslims, academics who are not Muslims. They have their own beliefs. But I don't think such questions are tackled because it's at the end of the day, it's not it's nothing it's not it's not something that you can prove or disprove, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I do remember I was told uh, that hundred years ago or before, probably around this time, in the libraries when they were in the Western libraries in Europe when they were cataloging the Quran, they would put author Muhammad instead oh. of of an author right i i was told that so uh, but then things changed um and uh, you stopped having this kind of label in the catalogs um so because things progress it's not because you know they want to uh, uh, not hurt muslims feelings about that but it's really academic studies progress to the point that it's really pointless to tackle this question you want to believe it's the word of god it is the word of God. You don't want to believe in that. It's not. So really, there's there's nothing that you can prove or disprove about it. So. I remember reading in some early records uh, one of the uh, one of the one of the first uh, critiques of Islam and Muhammad. On, um, I, I I fail to remember the name of the of the author. It's a Christian uh, scholar. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you have dealt with the topic. But he he for example in his uh, in his criticism of uh, Islam, which he um, refers to as something different. He doesn't mm -hmm. call it Islam, but he basically classifies it as a heresy of uh, as a as a Christian heresy. Right. And he, he basically also says um, Muhammad wrote a book in which he wrote this and this and this. So uh, it, it's very common to find in these early critiques and texts that they say Muhammad wrote Muhammad wrote down this and that. So right. I mean, it's, the perspective. it's, it's perfectly fine. And even uh, respected uh, orientalists mm -hmm. 
in a sense of their of their work um they they never thought that uh, the quran was a revelation it's mm-hmm. muhammad who uh, wrote the book and it's mm-hmm. it's perfectly fine uh, Nuldeke, the, the greatest one of the greatest german orientalist in that sense and he he was referring to the early period as muhammad's creative period in the oh, yeah. in the earlier surahs and then he started to lose his creativity uh, with the later uh, uh, maddening chapters, the verses got longer, repetitive, etc. Um, and everyone respects Nuldike and and his work, uh, mm-hmm. including Muslims, uh, right? So at the end of the day, it's your own uh, beliefs what what you want to believe about the Quran, whether it's the word of God or revelation or not. Um, it's uh, I think academia is beyond this. Mm-hmm. Um, so the short answer is no. And I gave you the long answer if it's satisfactory. So. That's a very uh, that's a very insightful answer, honestly. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, I want to proceed with the first of ten questions that I have um, that I have planned for today, which is uh, according to the Islamic uh, tradition and according to uh, academia surrounding the history of the Quran. Uh, did Muhammad have a physical Quran, or did he express? Uh, the intention to create a physical Quran? If you can give a short answer and a longer answer to this. Right. The short answer is it's very difficult to say um, because things from the early period are different from how things progressed in the later period. So most probably, let's not more, probably in the early period, there was no intention of having a physical text. Mm-hmm. And then in the later period, probably there there became an intention to have a physical text. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason for that is that the, uh, let's say the early period, which we refer to as the the, the early Meccan period, the objectives of Islam as a new religion was very different from the objectives of Islam in the later period, right? So in the early period, you want to convert the pagans, you want to convince them of the new religion. In the later period, you already have a core of uh, Muslims, and now you are trying to set new rules for the new community, uh, almost starting a new state. And when you have a new state, you do need a physical text. Yeah. Okay. Uh, So the, the short answer is, it depends on the period. It depends from whether you are dealing with early Islam or later Islam. Islam during the life of the prophet, not uh, not over the centuries. Uh-huh. Um, so we have accounts now. Getting to the longer answer, unless you have uh, um, that's fine question. Yeah. yeah. So and the, the longer answer or some of the details <clears throat> is that in the tradition we do have accounts about the prophet having scribes. Uh, it's almost verifiable, right? That he had scribes. There are many accounts about that. So if he had scribes, it means that he had some intention to write down, maybe not the whole text, some parts of it, uh, some verses, maybe important uh, chapters, I don't know. Uh, There are accounts of him trying to tell people to reorganize verses, put this verse here, remove this from there, right? Um, uh, there are also throughout the whole Quran, you, there are references to uh, the pre Islamic codices, mm-hmm. pre Islamic, right? The Bible, the, uh, um, the sheets of Abraham, of Moses. So if you are starting again a new religion and you have this concept that religions before you, they also had scriptures. So you also want to have a scripture as well. Yeah. I guess one thing that is confusing is that um, when you look into the into the Islamic tradition, uh, you find the reports of the compilation of the Quran mm-hmm. after the uh, after the death of Muhammad. Right. And what you also find in the report is the quote, um, "How can I do, or how could I do something that the Prophet himself did not uh, exactly. do or intend to do?" Correct. And, Correct. Uh-huh. Exactly. So this is uh, this is a a problem. Um, when you have competing traditions. So you have traditions, and not, not only that, I mean, even the, the collection of uh, the report of the collection of the Quran, the first one, how 
this companion, he was going around uh, trying to get the Quran from the hearts of man, uh, from camel shoulders, from leaves, etc. If the if, if the prophet already had some kind of collection, why do you why don't you go and consult it, mm -hmm. right? And there's no record in the collection that I went and consulted this uh, proto collection of the prophet, right? Uh, it gives you a very different idea of um, of how the Quran was at least memorized or scattered among people. So it is an it is a problem. Uh, how do you bring these competing traditions uh, together? Um, and there are also reports that uh, some of the wives of the prophet that they had a kind of protocodices as well, mm -hmm. uh, right? Aisha had it seems a codex according to one of the of the traditions. Um, his companions, they had some kind of codices, not necessarily full-fledged codices, but at least something. Um, right, so it is an issue when you are trying to bring these all these accounts together. And that's why usually Muslim scholars, they tend to focus more on chains of transmission of these reports. Mm -hmm. So, okay, well, this report has a better chain of transmission, so I will consider it more authentic than the other one. Mm -hmm. Or you try to come up with some kind of harmonizing yeah, these yeah, traditions, yeah. which which is very common uh, in, in the tradition. So thank you so much for for yeah. that. Uh, my second question will be kind of um, you. You will see that um, the questions may a little bit overlap uh, with each other, or right. might have been answered in a way or another, or sure. uh, in, in you know. It might go a little bit that way, but uh, my second question would be, uh, can it be confirmed with uh, certainty that the content and or the text of the Quran that we have today was mm -hmm. recited by Muhammad? Again, the short answer is no. We don't have a time machine to go back and, and, and see what he was reciting, okay? Um, the short answer is no. It's there's no there's always a probability issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's no hundred percent. There's no zero percent. It's always in between. Um, so we can never go beyond uh, reasonable doubt. We can never. No, you cannot. You, I mean, the issue. best you could do, the best you could do is you say not ninety nine percent. There's there's no way to say that the the the, the Quran as you have it today. It's exactly how. The prophet was reciting it. It's 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 impossible, especially that when you have so many traditions that tell you otherwise. Thank you. That's that's from within the tradition itself, right? So take for example, um, you heard of abrogation, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a common thing in the tradition. You have verses that abrogate other verses, not just the legal abrogation. It's just the verses completely taken out of the text. So at a certain point, these verses were recited, allegedly, by the companions, right? But then at a certain time, they were abrogated. This is actually a, an interesting topic to uh, quickly dwell on. Uh, when we talk about abrogation, uh, mm -hmm. there is much controversy about it. Uh, since it, it is a controversial topic, it is one that might uh, go into very problematic directions. Right. But uh, we, we talk about the nature of abrogation, and uh, there are different kinds of abrogation, apparently. Uh, right. In a way, we could say that um, verses that exist but were revealed later might right. abrogate rules that uh, are uh, revealed in verses that were revealed uh, earlier, but that also still exist. Right. But uh, but we also um, but there is also the concept of verses existing in the past mm -hmm. and then uh, getting lost or uh, being removed in right. favor of new verses that come into existence. This right. is also a form of abrogation that is accepted. Correct. So there are three three forms. Of, of abrogation accepted more generally and there are very few scholars who rejected that but let's say there is a consensus that the three types are accepted so the first one which you mentioned both verses exist in the text one abrogates the other mm -hmm. uh, some scholars put it this way it's not really abrogation but one is general and the other one is specific mm -hmm. 
So it's again one way to to get over the issue of abrogation. The second part, the one which you also mentioned, is uh, the text is removed, mm -hmm. but the rule is still there, such as the uh, stoning for yeah. adultery. Um, and the third type is that both uh, the rule and so the the text is uh, removed and the rule is also removed. Okay, so we have no trace of it. It is. Just right. Gone. So both bo both the rule and the the text are uh, are abrogated. Uh, so these three types, and there there are examples of of um, several examples of each type. Um, uh, and yes, the abrogation is generally accepted by by most scholars from from different uh, legal schools. Um, can you can you give us very short examples, like one or two of the uh, of of, the, of that kind? Yeah, for the the third one. Uh -huh. The, for example, this the uh, suckling. It's uh, called the ten sucklings. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's uh, this was it was supposed to be ten, and it was abrogated. Uh, the text uh, was abrogated. It, it's it must mention there, and the rule mm -hmm. is also abrogated. Mm -hmm. um, the second one is the uh, stoning, as we said, and the first one. There are many, many of them. The alcohol. Yeah. Uh, you know, the uh, fighting verse. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, there are also verses which do not have legal rulings um, that they seem to be also abrogated or removed from the text. Uh, some scholars put it also in the third category. There's one which says, uh, if, if man, um, uh, what? If if men would have a valley of uh, silver or gold, they will it will not fill their stomach. Something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really have a legal ruling, but um, it's a verse which allegedly was also abrogated. So I see, I see, yeah. I see. So I appreciate that. Yeah. So the point I was making about abrogation is that if we go by these traditions, these verses uh, were Quran at a certain point, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but then. Again, if we follow the tradition, they were abrogated later on. So at a certain point, they were Quran. But then at, a at another point in time, they ceased to be Quran. And my point is, if they were Quran at a certain point, they were recited by people, by the prophet and by the companions. But then they stopped reciting them later on. Mm -hmm. uh, which brings me back to your question is that that's one angle to even handle the question is that, of course, the Quran we have now it's almost, it's very difficult to say it's the same, exactly the same text that people were reciting 14, 1400 years ago. Um, not to mention variant readings, the codices of the companions, um, are different arrangements of, of, uh, of verses. Um, so, so yeah, this is why it's very challenging to say, well, it's exactly the same that the prophet was reciting because there are many traditions that tell you otherwise. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, the third question would be, uh, can it be verified that uh, the first Quran, the first physical Quran that came into existence, compiled, uh, is identical in content to the Quran that we have today? Uh, content? Not, not, yeah, not in, not in text, not in variants, uh, just uh, in content. So be, before it was put into a text or or after? After. So the first Quran that uh, right. was, that that was compiled and physically came into existence as a book. Can yeah. we can it be verified that uh, that book is identical to the Quran that we have today? Well, not identical hundred mm percent, -hmm. but very very close. Okay. Right. So we still had competing traditions of the other codices by the companions. Uh, Ibn Mas'ud had a codex, Ubay had a codex, which were different. And we all this is reported in the tradition. So there are sometimes differences in uh, chapters, in syntax. Uh, more or less, they follow the same structure, mm -hmm. but there are differences. So you can't say it's 100%. All the codices were similar. No one says that. Mm -hmm. uh, however, the the printed Qurans we have today, um, they are very similar. Almost, we can go to the ninety percent probabilities, ninety nine percent similar to 
I hate percentages and probabilities. They mm-hmm. they, they they don't tell you anything. It's I understand. When you hear ninety nine percent, okay, what about the one percent? <laughs> um, but they are very similar to what Muslims report, even without seeing manuscripts. We don't need manuscripts, okay? They are very similar to what Muslims reported about their own codices 1,300 years ago, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, The Othmanic Codex. Now, what was happening before that, God knows best. We don't know, yeah. We don't know. We don't have manuscripts. Uh, We, again, as I said, we don't really need manuscripts because Muslims actively reported about that. And they they themselves say that there were the codices were different. We have very much gone into this. Uh, my my fourth question is: uh, we have basically uh, implicitly answered this, this question already. But uh, my fourth question was going to be: uh, can it be proven beyond reasonable doubt uh, that the compilation of the Quran was done accurately? And <laughs> the short answer: we can't know, right? So, what does it mean accurately? Again. So what does it mean? What is accurate and what is what is the what's not accurate? So what would how could it be that we have done this process correctly? Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So you need the result needs to match the uh, the goal. Okay. So our goal is to collect the Quran. So did we collect the Quran exactly as the prophet was reciting it? We don't know. The arrangement of the chapters according to a consensus by Muslim scholars, it was done, the companions decided the arrangement. It's what if we fun. just focused on the content instead of ju- instead of the, uh, you know, the, the literary yeah. aspect of the, the, you know, the, the arrangements or all of that? Right. What if it came to the content? Uh, we could also not say about the content that, uh, that we can verify that it was done accurately. Right? So the content, um, it's, it's highly just studying the syntax of the mm-hmm. of the Quran. Okay, from from a linguistic perspective, it's very difficult to say that there are verses or uh, portions of the text that they don't belong there. Mm-hmm. Despite the fact that there are different styles in the early period and the later period, the register of the text is very similar. Okay. Now, there are scholars who did study uh, this from a syntactical perspective. And I think Behnam Sadiqi had an article on that. Um, uh, He's studying particles and the distribution of particles and the syntax of early text and later text. And there there are some conclusions to say, well, the author of this portion of the text could be different from the author of that portion of the text. Mm -hmm. So there are still people who, who do study this kind of thing. Um, but to say that there are portions of the text that do not belong there, um, it, it's, it's very difficult to prove. Okay. Uh, there, there's, there's really very hard, there's hardly any portion of the text that you could read. If you are familiar with the text that you would say, oh, well, this is completely out of context. Mm-hmm. There are problems with verses in, in in which they were put in the chapters where sometimes you feel they are out of context. Mm-hmm. Okay, the verses. So okay, what, what is this verse doing here? And it's very, it's very clear. I mean, this is a problem uh, atta- tackled by exegetes. They're trying to understand what is the relationship of this verse to that verse. Sometimes the pronouns completely shift. Uh, the story completely shifts. Um, yeah. um, one of the problems that I have when I read the Quran, I read it uh, many times through, and I still read it uh, on occasion in different parts again right. and again. And what I what I uh, often encounter and uh, criticize, sometimes severely, <laughs> is that um, it seems that when you read through the book from the beginning to the end, mm-hmm. uh, it doesn't seem like uh, it consistently stays on it, it is that it, it is not focused no on. i mean you you are right but it it maybe it wasn't supposed to okay yeah. uh, i would it would be very surprisingly to read the quran as if you are reading the bible i mm-hmm. mean that's one of the problems we have in teaching the quran it's very easy to teach the bible you go from 
chronologically, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's our Genesis, Exodus. It's, it's, it's just, you go, it's smooth. It's a story. The mm-hmm. Quran is not a story. It's not supposed to be a historical record. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's selections of liturgical text being recited, put together. Uh, some chapters make perfect sense. Mm-hmm. In, in, and there, there's a trend in the past 20 years where people are doing surah studies, how the verses are connected to one another. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, uh, the issue is that in the, in, you have to understand that the Quran came in a period where composition and books were not the norm or the custom. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing with Arabic poetry. If you read early Arabic poetry, read it in translation. There are many translations. It's the same thing. It doesn't follow a story from beginning to end. You would have verses scattered and just being compiled in one poem. I I, I could, uh, yeah. based on this idea, say that the Quran was a product of its time, but this would be, this would not necessarily be acceptable, acceptable an, an acceptable statement to it, many It, it is a product of its time. So it, 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 why would it not be acceptable? Uh, a statement? Do you mean from your perspective or from? No, I mean, I mean, to me, this would be a completely acceptable statement. I mean, the Quran right. was a, was naturally a product of its time, but uh, from the perspective of a believer, it wouldn't necessarily uh, be an acceptable thought to say that it was a product of its time. It would. Uh, one would rather think that it was not a product of its time. It was rather um, a perfect arrangement, divinely ordained uh, for I all see. time since. You know? Of course, there is a trend also in, in, in the tradition, not all of it, that mm-hmm. uh, the Quran is, um, is old. It's already written in the, in the preserved tablet. And you, you know, the, I, I believe you know this, uh, this tradition very well. So mm-hmm. yes, there is also a tradition in the... Uh, um, a trend in the Islamic tradition mm-hmm. that say, well, everything was ordained, everything was mm-hmm. predetermined, the text is perfect as is. But uh, again, these opinions, they don't have a, um, they are just, op- let's say, trends or opinions by scholars out of piety, mm-hmm. out of trying to polish the narrative. Uh, but Muslim scholars, exegetes, etc., they already notice that many, most of the Quran, it is a product of its time. No one mm-hmm. escapes from that from that reality, including the way, including the way it was arranged. And uh, also, we have to pay attention to how thoughts about Islam by Muslims it's, it changed over time. Mm-hmm. The concerns of, of of Muslims in the early period are very different from the concerns of. Of Muslims in the on the later period. Yeah, that's I see that. Uh, in the early period, and throughout the whole Quran and traditions, you know, the Prophet is struggling to get divine revelation. He's even struggling with 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 the devil. But mm-hmm. speaking of abrogation, there are also many opinions that abrogation doesn't necessarily have to do with abrogation. It's about the devil sometimes inspiring, or or inspiring is the wrong word but you know trying to put some verses doing waswasa right um it's a very controversial topic that we have had yeah and it was, but it was very normal in the early yeah. period uh-huh. so you read early exegetes and opinions by scholars uh that's what it meant mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are guarding the quran from the interference of the devil mm-hmm. uh you are a true prophet don't worry this is speech to to, to muhammad right yeah but then in the, the tradition later on completely almost switched the, the narrative that the prophet is, he doesn't commit mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are some, there are some very, uh, z- there is a very zealous opposition to that entire idea, especially right. in today's time by certain people that uh, know that was a misunderstanding. It is Correct. impossible that the, that the devil interfered in the revelations. Correct. Correct. Muhammad was completely free from such things. The revelation yeah. was perfect. Uh, but in the early accounts, we see that there were um, what came to be known as the, as the, um, the satanic Verses. The satanic verses, yeah, the satanic uh, verses, the interference of the of the devil, and even it's uh, when the prophet was not receiving revelation, he he would he would get uh, very depressed, yeah. uh, confused, um, uh, desperate. Um, 
But then the narrative changes later on mm -hmm. uh, because Muslims start to have a new understanding or different understanding of how things were. Uh -huh. So again, it's all it all depends which period you are focusing on, which period you are trying to understand and to, mm -hmm. to differ from one time to, to, to another. So Thank you so much. This was yeah. very wholesome. Um, uh, moving on to uh, question number five. Um, are you okay with everything so far? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. fantastic. Uh, question number five would be, um, this might be a little bit um, uh, a question of uh, polemics and controversy. You may answer it as you wish. You may think it's not entirely relevant. Uh, but if it were suggested that the Quran and its uh, backstory may very well be um, an invention by people, Mm -hmm. And that this book was not, in fact, delivered by a character named Muhammad. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have proper evidence to refute that with certainty? Uh, to refute that the Quran was invented by uh, a person or persons other than Muhammad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it goes both way. I mean, also we un we we answered that shortly before is that we don't we don't know what happened before mm -hmm. Uthman mm -hmm. or before the collection of the codices. Okay, so it might be if we if we want to talk objectively. Okay, so it it might be this person who was called Muhammad, or it could be another person. Um, but it's very difficult also to say. Well, there was a group of people who came up with the Quran out of nothing, and then they told the whole community, mm -hmm. uh, oh, look, we have this Quran. It, wa it, came, it was revealed to a prophet called Muhammad, and we have it, and people never heard about that before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Especially that uh, Islamic history teaches us that Muslims never agreed on, on anything, <laughs> right? And they have been there fighting was much schism from the very beginning. Yeah. From the very beginning, since the Prophet died, and even before he died, mm -hmm. there are many factions within Islam, and each faction has its factions. So many people have different uh, objectives, trying to prove or disprove something about the prophecy, about the Quran. So it's very difficult to say. Well, the Umayyads came, and. Uh, this is something that was mentioned by Wonsbro um, 50, 60 years ago in his, in his book. That was a narrative that the Quran was collected 60, 70 years by the Umayyads, and then it was uh, distributed okay, from, yeah. from high above. It's very unlikely to believe this narrative because there are many people who were opposing the Umayyads and who still had copies of the Quran and they had their own Quran. Um, so you really, if you really need to go after this narrative, you need a lot of evidence yeah. and arguments to, to support it. And the Umayyads were um, surrounded by controversy from their rise to their decline Correct. and, and yeah. beyond. And they were not popular by, yeah. <laughs> by all means. They were not even popular, uh, including Sunni Muslims, not yeah. just Shia Muslims. So there are many people who, who I mean, there are, we already have records of people during that time who already have Qur'ans. Now, what kind of Qur'an, what kind of fragments, uh, what kind of arrangement chapters? That's, again, difficult to say. But the concept that there was a Qur'an, that this Qur'an came to a person called Muhammad, that they called a prophet, uh, it's a narrative uh, that is very prevalent in, in Islamic history by different Islamic factions and groups. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In my personal opinion, I mean, I don't, I don't think it is. Um, I this would not be a question that I personally would ask because, in my opinion, it is uh, very unlikely that the Quran was kind of made up out of thin air uh, right. without a character named Muhammad at its core. I, I would think that it is the best possible explanation that Muhammad did in, indeed exist, that he did indeed uh, recite or you know dictate at mm -hmm. least most or parts of the Quran that we have today. What I would uh, question is uh, who Muhammad was and his intentions and all that. It's the, sure. yeah, but 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 this is a question that is in existence. And so I thought it's no, I mean, relevant. That's, that's perfectly a, a, um, a legitimate uh, question. And there mm -hmm. are people who work. Uh, I mean, look, there are two uh, 
sorry to digress about this point a little bit, but there are two lines of, of, um, of investigation here. Mm -hmm. So you have one line, people trying to understand Islam uh, within its context, late antiquity, who Muhammad was, uh, was there a Muhammad? Uh, these are all what kind of person he was. Mm -hmm. um, was he really a prophet? Was he receiving something or was he just a politician? It's legitimate line of investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe he was receiving revelation from aliens <laughs> and Jibreel was a hologram. And, you know, the Burak was a, star, a, a starship. There are some, some people who wrote some, mm -hmm. not in academia, but... Uh, if you read Islamic history on that light, you would be amazing. It's almost science fiction, right? That uh, is a very interesting perspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes you read these narratives when 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 the prophet saw Gabriel, you know, he was stretching from from sky to earth. You think, oh wow, it's a hologram, okay? <laughs> uh, hearing voices, maybe he was, I don't know, zooming, right? And mm -hmm. uh, someone was zooming with him and uh, teaching him the Quran. I'm making things up now, but I'm saying that if we prove that, if someone can, okay, well, we prove that the Quran came from Martians or from aliens, this doesn't help me to understand how Muslims understood the Quran in the past 1400 years. Exactly. Yeah. That's... Because they never thought about this. Mm -hmm. So it helps me, it helps the other line of, okay, we understand the origins of the Quran. We, we knew where it came from, but how does that help me understand how Muslims understood the Quran 1200 years ago, right? Perfect, perfect. Nice so difficulty. that's how I would put it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, my next question would be, uh, this is the sixth question on my list, uh, would be, um, I know you will have a problem with the word miraculous here, but uh -huh. <laughs> I'm trying to put it in a context uh, that we can evaluate it from a uh, academic professional perspective. Which but doesn't if, occur in the Quran, by the way, the, the oh, word miraculous. Okay. So okay, I didn't actually go into that. I mean, the, the, the whole notion of uh -huh. Ajaz, it just came later, but uh -huh. it's not it's not a uh, the term isn't there. So, okay. yeah. So the question would be, can the Quran be considered uh, unique, miraculously unique mm -hmm. in terms of its uh, literary qualities and its uh, content? Is it incomparable to other texts? It is unique, but it is not miraculously unique. <laughs> okay, so okay. every text is unique. It's not just because it's the Quran. The, the collection of poetry by... Mutanabbi is also unique, mm -hmm. for example, a famous Arab poet. Mm -hmm. uh, every text is unique, but the Quran is definitely unique that there are, there are no similar texts mm -hmm. uh, in terms of content uh, and style, more or less. Style uh, in, in how it was compiled and, and not necessarily the register of, of Arabic, but just its style. Now, miraculous again it's very loaded word and not all muslims muslim scholars not just talking about lay muslims thought that the style of the quran was miraculous again mm -hmm. the concept developed over time there are many muslim scholars who thought that the quran is not miraculous styles from a stylistic point of view but the miraculous aspect is that god prevented people from imitating it mm -hmm. okay so that's what if we change the wording from uh, miraculously unique to superior or sublime? So can the Quran be considered superior in terms of literary qualities and content to any other book out there? I wouldn't say superior, but I would say that the Quran stylistically, it is very, it's written, composed in a very high register mm -hmm. of Arabic. It is used on the same level as Arabic poetry. Mm -hmm for okay. grammar uh textual um, um, uh, examples to prove um uh, things related to language philology etc early muslims they were not quoting the quran to prove scientific phenomena mm -hmm. or mathematical phenomena they were only using it for linguistic issues Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so yes, the Quran is written in a high register, uh, whether it's superior or not, 
it's again up to there are many scholars arab scholars who didn't think that the quran stylistically is superior to other compositions mm -hmm. there are other people who thought it was superior it's not really a clear issue i mean it, it took three it took more than 400 years for muslim scholars to come up with a uh, somehow a framework of what inimitability stylistic inimitability it took 400 years for someone to come and and and, and frame that uh, in, in a theory of semantics and philology etc so it's not really you read something oh well this is miraculous or this is pure. so what, what's miraculous about it you have to feel it you have to know arabic okay well i know arabic but i still can't feel it mm -hmm. Well, it's very subtle, really. It's not really something you can put your finger on. This would be connected to the next question, which is uh, the seventh question that I have on my list uh, is something that I deal with, uh, that I have dealt with um, a few times, I would say, before. But if I were to uh, write a competing book today, uh -huh. uh, considering that the Quran makes a challenge and it says, uh, if they are truthful, then, uh, you know, uh, or uh, right. let, let them produce something like it or let them mm -hmm. produce something better. Uh, if I were to write a competing book today, mm -hmm. would it be possible to say that uh, this is objectively, so my book is objectively not equal to or better than the Quran. No, because you will you will need 400 years for people to study your book <laughs> in order to to reach. And then by that, that by that time, the Quran would have 2,800 years of people studying it. And it uh -huh. will always be, there's it's not going to happen. I mean, there's a there's a, a famous um, uh, Arab uh, poet and writer. Um, he wrote a competing book in the three, mid fourth century. That would be tenth century. His name is Abu Ala Al Maari. Very famous, one of mm -hmm. um, like Shakespeare in in, in, in English. Uh, and he wrote a book, a thick book, imitating the style of the Quran. It's published. It's available. It's called Al Fusul Wal Ghayat. If people uh, read Arabic on your channel and want to check it out, very eloquent. It's excellent masterpiece. And they asked him, uh, what happened? They are making fun of him after he wrote it and published it. So what happened to your Quran? Why, why didn't it become famous? He said, well, it wasn't polished in mosques for 400 years. <laughs> wow. <laughs> right? Uh, and this is 10th century. So the, the, the point is, uh, issues of superiority in style it, no, you, you, it's not going to be an, an objective uh, criterion where someone, oh, look, I produced something. People will always poke holes mm -hmm. in whatever you write. Uh, and there's no really objective criteria to say, well, this verse or this uh, poem is better than the other poem. Yeah, so my criticism of that was, for example, um, that I find the challenge unreasonable or mm -hmm. incoherent if i may say because um even if i did intend to and i don't intend to do this but even if i did intend to uh write something down today that i uh that i would think is uh a competition to the quran mm -hmm. then no matter how good it is no matter mm -hmm. how good i think it is no matter how good people think it is right. uh people who value the quran as the sublime book will always be able to say, no, your book is worse than the Quran because of this and this of and course. this. And there's an endless supply of reasons yeah. to come up with why. And, you will, and uh, you will need time. You will, you will need mm -hmm. 1,000 years of scholarship on your book mm -hmm. to reach uh, this level, right? Yeah. So let's say the Bible, it has hundreds, thousands of years of, of studies on it, uh, but then where the comparison stops at language. Well, all oh, the, the Bible or Old Testament, Old Testament, they are not as eloquent as the Quran. Well, of course they are not because they are in translation. So the same thing goes with the Quran. If you translate it, it, it loses everything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Now, how they were in the original language, that's not, but I don't think they make the claim that they are syntactically and mm -hmm. from a literary perspective that they are miraculous. Yeah. Uh, or an inimitable and also the quran when it produces there are also many problems with that challenge okay produce a book like it or a chapter like it but it doesn't specify from which perspective yeah 
Okay. That, that's the thing. If you set a challenge without setting the 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 the, the rules, uh, right? So of the challenge, then there and, is no and challenge. That's what that's what Muslim scholars debated. So it wasn't, you know, again, the later narrative is all about the uh, miraculous and inimitable nature of of the text of the Quran. But also, this wasn't the case early on. I mean, you, you see, in the past, I would say, 100, 150 years. Uh, because this argument started to lose uh, favor. Mm -hmm. Why? Because many Muslims don't can't read the Quran in Arabic. Ninety five percent of them, mm -hmm. they are not Arabs. Even Arabs who can read the Quran, they only understand the simple chapters. But even educated Arabs can't read it unless they really have decent education in, in Arabic to read it and appreciate it. So you started to, to have this shifting narrative towards other miraculous issues in the Quran, mathematics, science, astrology, to support the argument that it's miraculous all over, not just syntax. Mm -hmm. Early scholarship didn't pay attention to, to that. It was only focusing on uh, syntax um, because people had a stronger connection. Mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the language, with the culture, with the text, and they were not thinking about numbers mm -hmm. and uh, astrology, medicine, all this, all this stuff. Yeah. Moving on to a related question, um, the eighth question on my list is, uh, the Quran says in chapter 5, verse 15, um, among others, that it is a uh, clear book. Mm -hmm. And of course, it is debatable uh, what clear in this context uh, actually right. means. Uh, would the Quran be considered clear? Some of it is clear, some of it is not clear. <laughs> uh, so as the Quran itself say, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it's all about perspective and something that might not be clear to you now or to us, it could have been clear to people 1400 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I think I mentioned uh, something very quickly to, to Derek. Uh, on, on his uh, YouTube last month Myth about vision. acronyms mm -hmm. LOL or ROFL so if you give this to an American I don't know 60 years ago do they understand what ROFL mean <laughs> or LOL they will never even though they are English native speakers we understand we don't even need to know what, what these acronyms used for so take the mysterious letters in the Quran or the disconnected letters, maybe they meant something for, for the people 1400 years ago. They didn't ask that many questions about it. They just took it. But then- What is strange about that is we don't uh, actually have any record of anyone ever asking about those things we, in the we Hadith. We don't. I mean, we have some accounts and then you have competing traditions, what they could mean, but there's no consensus whatsoever mm -hmm. what they really mean. They, they, they go from- esoteric interpretations into really literal, um, sometimes mathematical. You know, these letters compose the, the alphabet of Arabic, and it's a miracle that out of these 27 or 28 letters, Arabic, the Quran is being composed of. It's a, you have so many, you have more than 30 opinions of, of what they could have meant. But we don't have records of someone going to the prophet and saying, oh, what does uh, Alif Lam Mim mean? or ALR, and then he responds clearly. They, there, there's nothing um, um, sound tradition like that. Maybe they understood, maybe they didn't. But the point is many, many things could have been clear to them and not clear to us um, and vice versa. If you are a believer, if you are a Muslim and you think that the Quran is a book for all ages, Maybe there were things that were not clear to them, and then it could become clear to you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right now. So it goes both way. Um, so again, the, the answer is some of it clear, some of it is not clear. From, from a linguistic perspective, uh, the text is clear. It reads in Arabic. Uh, if you have training in Arabic, you can understand it. Yes, there are many problematic verses from a syntactical point. Exegetes and scholars tackled that. They have many different interpretations of it. Yes, there are some verses which uh, which are problematic uh, because of some grammatical uh, inconsistencies. 
maybe there are some mistakes in uh, this in, in copying the text, uh, which uh, resulted in an unusual grammatical reading. Uh, but more or less, the text reads fine. And just as any text which is written in a high register, like poetry, you read a poem and you would say, well, is the poem clear to you? No one would say that, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, I understand all the poem. And the yeah. Quran, at the end of the day, it's not poetry, but it is poetic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not meant to be a, an article mm -hmm. or an essay. Um, there are many verses which deal with legal issues. They are plain prose. There's even nothing poetic about them. And no one really argues about how mm -hmm. clear they are. Um, so it depends which verses, especially early period, early verses seem to be more cryptic about the day of judgment. I mean, you, no one can imagine that. Yeah, so it, yeah, it has yeah. to be cryptic. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Uh, that. So. Uh, the next question would be, um, I'm trying to kind of uh, tweak this in a, <laughs> in a way because... Uh, I know, based on the conversation that we had so far, the, the yeah. plan kind of changed of my last two questions. Okay. But um, as much as we can answer this question, um, is is the claim that the Quran has no mistakes mm -hmm. verifiably true? This is a claim that is made by uh, Muslims in general. Uh, gram grammatical mistakes or mistakes, uh, you mean uh, errors? Uh, in 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 uh, in its uh, content, in the things that it says, in the claims that it makes, right? Um, in, the I mean, in the information that it provides, can it be said okay. that in that sense it is it has no mistakes? Uh, so first aspect, let's talk about syntax or or grammatical mistakes. Okay, mm -hmm. so this is very. Uh, what does a grammatical mistake mean? It means that you have a certain set of of grammar or rules of grammar. Set by whom? By people. People mm -hmm. create language, okay? And then you have a text which violates this set of rules. Uh, so when the Quran was uh, composed during that period, Arabic grammar was not standardized. Mm -hmm. So what we consider or what, what grammarians 200 years later on considered to be grammatical inconsistencies in the Quran uh, they, of course, had different ways of trying to, to patch this to say, well, this is according to that Arabic dialect, not to this Arabic dialect, and it could be resolved in this way. So the short answer is yes, there are many grammatical inconsistencies in the Quran. If you only take one standardized version of Arabic grammar. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there are also issues with the copying of the text that resulted probably from you know with uh, pr um, some inconsistencies because of some scribal errors that mm -hmm. happened okay um however because the text more or less is written in a high register of language okay uh, it's not you know 50 percent of it is mistakes or 60 yeah. percent it's again I, I i dislike percentages but there are there are many cases but you are talking about six thousand. 200 verses plus mm -hmm. and the problematic verses i would say i don't know 200 300 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay so mm -hmm. that's from 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 the linguistic perspective the, the, the issue is um there, there's often this this uh understanding which honestly i am not uh 100 familiar with right. uh which is that the arabic language is based on the quran or the uh the classical arabic language uh is is uh, based on the Quran or was formed or shaped no, that's, by that's the Quran? No, that's a misconception. The Quran okay. is based on Arabic, not the Arabic is based okay. on the Quran. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, and again, it's always uh, Quran and Arabic poetry. They were the basis for how Arabic grammar was standardized. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. But they, but there was Arabic before the Quran. Okay. And when and when the Quran is. Uh, judged based upon the arabic that existed before the quran then you could say that there are certain things within the quran that are not uh correct that are not not consistent not perfect correct. but correct. then again that depends entirely on, on, on especially perfect. when you take 
the whole tradition of variant readings. Mm -hmm. People only now focus mostly on one reading, mm -hmm. but the other six or nine readings, which have many grammatical variations from the standard Arabic, uh, grammarians always recourse to other dialects, mm -hmm. okay, to try to justify this peculiar grammatical anomaly, let's say, uh -huh. okay. Uh, there were treatises even written about you know one one or two verses which are grammatically completely should be incorrect. Uh -huh. If they were written by a person by a poet, they would go after him. It's like oh this is wrong, you don't justify. But because it's the Quran, you have to justify. It cannot be wrong. Okay, yeah, right. So, so there cannot there can not be a mistake. It, it's impossible to be wrong. There must yeah. be an interpretation for it, and this is why grammarians do everything they could to say that this text is justifiable. And That's the main problem that we have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, when, uh, when it comes they, to the they information. They don't want to say there's, it's impossible to say that there's a scribal error. There's no error. God mm -hmm. is, is, uh, is, is, is even inspiring the scribes um, yeah. to, to write correctly. There are no such thing as a mistake. There's no such thing as scribal error. It's almost, they are not humans. I mean, even computers make mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's a, a, a the, the narrative is very different from the early period. You have many voices among Muslim scholars who did say that there are errors, there are mistakes. We did our best to fix mm -hmm. the text. God knows best. Okay. Move on, move on, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. But that's not how things became lately. Yeah. Lately, not in the past 10 years, but probably in the past few hundred years, mm -hmm. uh, where no, every everything uh, should be perfect. There's no there's no room for error, mm -hmm. and that's that's the issue here. Even within the first uh, few hundred years, it wasn't what um, wasn't it, uh, it? Theological schools within within Islam emerged, and there were mm -hmm. the discussions on uh, on the nature of the Quran, whether mm -hmm. the Quran exactly as it is, as we have it, was indeed uh, authored by Allah before existence, or right, whether right. it whether it coexisted with Him, uh, it's, and, it's a it's a debate uh, until today. People uh -huh. among Muslims uh, uh -huh. is the uh, Quran eternal? Uh, is it uh, created? Means is it is it new? And back to abrogation. If you are mm -hmm. saying that there are abrogated verses, so were these verses when they were Quran? They were old, but then they became new. How could you abrogate something that is eternal? Yeah, we could. I guess we could argue forever about the nature right? of that. No. So the, yeah, the point yeah. is that people were discussing these things. They were not. Mm -hmm. They they were not, uh, you know, naive to the idea that oh well, everything is perfect and everything. Mm -hmm. No, they they knew there were problems, mm -hmm. and they wrote books and treatises about them, and they were trying to understand what does it mean that this is the speech of God. Yeah. And they debated it, and they never resolved it, and they will mm -hmm. never resolve it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so and that's the first. The second question about air information, uh, it's very hard to say. You, again, it, what's the role of the Quran? Is it is it a uh, a book uh, that is trying to offer you information? Is it a book that is trying to give you scientific? Um, rules? Is it a book that is trying to teach you about the world? Or is it a book for liturgical purposes? And again, the role of the Quran as a text changes with time. Um, so I don't think people in the early period were trying to understand the world around them through the lens of the Quran, mm -hmm. or trying to find out the speed of light and the density of water through the Quran. This mm -hmm. is all later on, mm -hmm. later but, development, in a so sense. The you know, there is a debate based on uh, the idea uh, which the Quran implies. And for example, uh, at, the, at the very beginning, in chapter two, verse two, it says, "There mm -hmm. is no." Uh, this is a book about which there is no doubt. Right. Uh, in chapter four, it says uh, something like, "If it were from any other than Allah, he would find uh, within it uh, contradiction." Or, right. Or, and um, so the many, idea developed. Big, many, many contradictions. Yeah, yeah many contradictions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the idea developed over time. That's the idea developed that this is the uh, inspired uh, word and is it is free Correct. from flaws and that uh, suggesting that it has flaws would be 
uh, equal to disbelief. So there, there is now there are now two two sides of the debate here that it is entirely perfect and that it has mistakes. And then there is there might be of course the middle ground that you know. Uh, what what would be the the scholarly academic uh, evaluation of this uh, debate? Is it verifiable? that the Quran has no mistakes, as it is claimed, or? I mean, same answer to uh, the beginning of the conversation. It's, uh, it's all about context, mm -hmm. when the Quran was revealed, and what you as an academic, what are you trying to achieve? It's again, a, um, I don't say a meaningless uh, quest to try to, oh, well, the Quran says this about the beginning of the universe. And now we know that the beginning of the universe was due to the Big Bang. Therefore, mm -hmm. the Quran is wrong. What do you expect? You expect the Quran 1400 years ago to say the Big Bang started the universe 14 billion years ago? I mean, it's it's unbelievable. I mean, whether it's a revelation or not. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if it, even if you believe it was a revelation, imagine telling a Bedouin in a desert that there's a Big Bang and the speed of light is this, and there are parallel universes and string theory, and it, it, it's not going to work out, yeah. right? So you tell him, you do well, you go to heaven, you, you drink cold water, and you have lots of milk that doesn't spoil, because always milk spoiled, you know, during that, that day. So you talk to them in the language they understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's the same thing with all the other... Uh, misinformation now historical inconsistencies that's another issue uh and scholars do work about that especially theologians so what does it mean on the quran say that there are some jews who say that god has a son mm -hmm. okay so as scholars, the, Israel, the son of allah right uh, so yeah. scholars are interested in that so is this a misinformation or were there really some judeo-christian factions in in arabia that really believed that uh, god has a son Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, as far as Judaism goes, I mean, they have no information that there are factions within Judaism that says God has a son. Mm -hmm. uh, so why the Quran said that? Is it, there, is it a mis misinformation or was there really a group, a faction that, that claimed that, right? Uh, but I don't think any academic would be interested to say, oh, well, the Quran said that because Muhammad mistranslated a text from the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, it, Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But I don't think we are interested in these kind of questions because we are interested in why the Quran, how the Quran was handling issues uh, back then and not mm -hmm. and what people believed. Maybe this was something that people believed in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And the Quran is just re-emphasizing re re that or re-putting uh, this into context, that there are some Jews who are saying that. But maybe that's what people thought. <laughs> Mis being misinformed. Just to have an overview on on that uh, yeah. on that example, like the Quran says in chapter nine, verse uh, thirty, I believe uh, it says, uh, "Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah," mm -hmm. and it goes on. Uh, how, how how are they deluded? Mm -hmm. And uh, the suggestion on my end, for example, uh -huh. on the end of critics of Islam, would be that's misinformation because uh, right. Jews don't believe that right. and uh, we don't believe we don't know of such Jews who believed that and even if it was referring to a small group of Jews the first wouldn't make much sense right. on the other hand uh, the Muslim position the believing Muslim position would be uh, it, it cannot be wrong it cannot mm -hmm. be false there is right. an explanation to it and we will somehow find this explanation so uh, we are on these on these two ends one side asserting okay based on uh, the evidence that we have the best possible explanation is that it is wrong the other side says best based on the best possible explanation that is definitely somehow true right. in the middle of this uh, of this debate the academic perspective i guess would be that uh it is not verifiable and, pos and not also relevant. also not relevant to the i'm, to I'm the, more interested the why did the quran say that yeah yeah not yeah. whether it's right or wrong yeah uh -huh. it, it's it could be it could be that there were i mean it's similar to now we're saying muslims say that mm -hmm. but not all muslims say that right so it, it would be a futile discussion to go after whether uh, that is true or not, because right. Yeah. Okay. So so now we will talk about the Quran and preservation and tablets. You know, say okay, Muslims think that the Quran is uh, preserved in this manner, but it's not all Muslims. It's three or four percent of Muslims who believe that the Quran 
is the speech of God, sound and letter, etc. The ninety five percent of Muslims don't believe that, right? Okay, so the, the example, general Muslim believe. Okay, okay, for okay, yeah. For example, I mean, uh -huh. back to the Quran. Now, now this is a fact. Ninety five percent of Muslims in the past fourteen hundred years. Okay, this is the Ash'ari school or the Maturidi school. They don't believe that the Quran, in its sounds and letters, it is the speech of God. Mm -hmm. it's not, that, that's not what they believe. Okay, mm -hmm. they believe that the speech is something. Okay, but okay. then the actual utterances of the Quran, the sounds and letters, they are not the actual words of God. Mm -hmm. But then you have the other three or four percent of Muslims uh, who believe that the actual sounds and letters are exactly how God pronounced the Quran. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So one could say well, Muslims believe that. But it's only a, a fraction of them who believe that. But there are mm -hmm. also another, a huge fraction of them who don't believe in this. So mm -hmm. I'm giving you as an example of maybe there was a faction among you know, Judeo Christians in Arabia who believed in that. Maybe not. Maybe there is a misinformation. But the more relevant question, at least to me, is why the Quran said that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was it really a misinformation? Was it mistranslation? Was it um, uh, a was it a group of of Jews who who believed in that? But whether it's verifiable or not, we have to rely on Judaic studies mm -hmm. to see what kind of what factions of groups and most of uh, of Jews were available in, Ar and in Arabia at that time and whether they can verify this information or not. If they mm -hmm. can't, I'm more interested in why the Quran said that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily if it's true or not, at mm -hmm. least my perspective. Yeah, um, just to clarify an earlier point, uh, yeah. when we look at the at, uh, at least at Sunni Islam, and when we yeah. look at the, the prevailing schools, the right. the Asherites, the uh, yes. ma the Maturidis, yes. the the Atharis, which would uh, make up the vast majority of Muslims that we have today, mm -hmm. uh, they disagree on the nature of uh, the speech mm -hmm. and the pre-existence and existence of the Quran. But what they do agree on uh, is that the Quran, that the information provided in the Quran, that the Quran we have today was inspired by. Correct, Allah. correct. All Muslims, all Muslims revealed. and all factions, Sunnis, Shias, etc., that the Quran is a revelation from God. Okay. That's okay. agreement, okay? Mm -hmm. Consensus. Mm -hmm. The disagreement is the chunk or the huge chunk of Sunni Muslims, the Ash'aris and the Maturidis, right? Mm -hmm. With the Salafis, let's say, mm -hmm. or the Hanbalis, is the nature of the speech of God. Mm -hmm. Is it sounds of letters or it is, um, is it the Arabic sounds of letters? or it is not. Okay. So the disagreement until today, and it, it leads to one faction considering the other faction a disbeliever. And, yeah. and uh, you know, among, this is among the same Sunni Islam, we're not even talking about other factions. So I'm saying that the vast majority of Muslims, though the Ash'aris, they already solved the issues of grammar, variants, etc., saying that those utterances are not the actual utterances of God. God did not speak those words. But you have the other groups who would say, no, he did speak those words as they are. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the but but all of them agree that the, the Quran is a revelation from God. I believe. Um, Without a doubt. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure in which, uh, in who, who, who this was. One of the significant uh, scholars of um of theology uh, within within Islam of Akita, uh -huh. um, I believe said said something along the lines of, um, the Quran is the revealed word of Allah, mm -hmm. and whoever does not add unchanged to it is a disbeliever or something like that. And um, so, uh, so, no, I mean it is uh, it is a valid legal point, but again the problem is what what do we mean by and uh, what do we mean by unchanged? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Is it unchanged that it is altered uh -huh. or is it the way it's pronounced it's unchanged because mm -hmm. we do know for a fact that there are many letters that we pronounce today are very different from how letters were pronounced 1400 years ago mm -hmm. that's a fact in, mm -hmm. in recitation there are two or three letters that the way of uttering them or pronouncing them were very different so what do we mean by unchanged is it unaltered that there's no replacement for one word to another word uh, but that's also, again, problematic because we do also know that many companions did replace one word by another. Mm -hmm. 
synonyms, Ibn Mas'ud as an example, for, and this, this tradition continued for hundreds of years. But then there, there was a consensus among Muslim scholars in all factions that the Quran is as is, as we have it today. We don't change any synonym of it. We don't replace one word by another. Uh, so I would again ask, what do we mean by unchanged? The, the change uh, of Ibn Masood, was it uh, in uh, reciting the Quran that uh, a synonym of a specific reciting, word? Not, not just, be, not just okay. a, you know, you have now a trend, they say, well, this was only a tafsir or, or mm -hmm. exegesis uh, trying to interpret it, but it's not. There, there are a few examples of this, but it was a recitation. It okay. was public recitation. And there are tons of, of narrations and the sources that this was in his codex. Mm -hmm. uh, people were reciting in, in, in Ibn Mas'ud's recitation in Iraq for at least 200 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are transmissions on that. So it is public liturgical recitation and not just uh, a work on grammar, let's say, or, or, or uh, interpretation or tafsir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank yeah. you for that. Okay, I, th I think we're very much um, through with the with the, with the questions uh, that we have. Uh, I want to ask one final uh, question, which might be, I guess, hard at this point to to okay. answer. Just uh, just very briefly, um, based on the concept of best possible uh, explanations, uh, what would be the best answer? in your professional opinion, to the question, who wrote or who authored the Quran? Uh, as a person, you know, or <laughs> a person, I mean, it's back to the original question. If you, if you believe, you would say that it's a uh, revelation. If you don't believe, it's Muhammad who wrote it. It's mm. as simple as that. It's very difficult to say, I mean, even... Um, I mean, even from um, if you take a Muslim perspective on that, uh, it's a very difficult question. Okay, well, it's a revelation from God, but it's not the actual letters and sounds. It's only the syntax. Mm -hmm. Okay, the arrangement, the syntax. What about the utterances? What about the case endings, the grammar? Uh, so my my answer would be. Um, uh, the composition, the, the actual composition, is uh, done by an entity. If you believe in God and Islam, it's God who, who composed it, okay? Mm -hmm. If you don't believe, it's Muhammad or a person. Consistently, consistently uh, uh, writing this work in this composition. However, the book as a whole, it was, a, it was arranged... Um, edited, recited, uh, polished over decades and even centuries by the community. Okay. Right? So the way that the Quran is recited, we can easily verify through our sources that styles of recitation developed over time. Mm -hmm. They were not the way that you hear now the Quran. It's highly improbable that this is how they were reciting it 1400 years ago. Mm -hmm. with the complex rules of recitation and how grammar developed. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to say, well, this, is, this text was composed by this person and it is as, as is, as we have, we have it today, it is as we have it before. It took really at least hundreds of years to reach this kind of stage. And it was done by the efforts of, of scholars, of linguists, of theologians over the over the centuries so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. hopefully we will find a, a time machine in the future we go back <laughs> and then we you know i mean even even if you uh, even if you say that muhammad composed it as an as someone who doesn't believe it's still interesting to to see how the process was definitely yeah definitely. Uh, the, the differences between the early period, the later period, how he was reciting it, how how uh, people were reacting to it, uh, what kind of changes that happened through his life over the 23 years that he was preaching uh, that led to this, their repetition. They have so many repetitive verses in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Were they really repeated because of the copying process or was it really repeated during the course of revelation? Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You have many mm-hmm. chunks of verses and stories repeated over and over and yeah. over. Yeah. Um, so this repetition is a is a is a, a sign of orality. You don't have this kind of repetition in a in a composed work. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's again one argument against people or against the group of people who say, well, the Quran was a composed text at a certain point of time. Repetition is a sign of orality. Mm-hmm. Uh, 99%, let's say, not 100%. You don't have someone who's writing, who's sitting down and writing something, and then you keep repeating the frames all, all over the Quran. I'm not just talking about one chapter. Uh, so the, the composition, the arrangement, it's very peculiar, and it's mm-hmm. really almost an impossible question to answer. Who, yep, who composed yep. it based on on the tools that we have today? Yep. If I were to sit down today and and uh, write a book that uh, is aimed to be considered a well written book by um, and, and evaluated by uh, scholars and by right. readers as a as a good uh, readable book, if I want to increase the readability of the of the book, then mm-hmm. I would have to I would write a book that uh, were. Uh, the content is properly organized and put into a of line of thoughts, right. separated chapter for chapter, and uh, in which uh, many. Otherwise, they will not publish not... your work. They will they will reject it. So, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So, again, the standards the standards of publication today are very different from the standards fourteen hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Maybe your book that you are writing today. If you publish it 1400 years ago, no one will read it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> because they don't want something to be that organized. Mm-hmm. I mean, it took mm-hmm. some time to get this kind of organization. And this is a feature in, in Islamic or slash Arabic books in general, is that authors jump from one topic to another and they repeat things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, many books were dictated. I'm talking about theological books and even books of exegesis. They were, uh, you, have an, you have a scholar uh, who is dictating that to his students. He's not mm-hmm. sitting on his desk and writing. Sometimes they do, but most of the time they dictate. Mm-hmm. And because of this uh, process of dictation, there are many repetitions throughout the work. Yeah, for, uh, when I think about, uh, when I look at, um, I'm kind of dragging the conversation right now, but yeah. no worries, <laughs> when, yeah. when, I, when I look at lists of, of uh, you know, best books ever written in terms of uh, their literary aspects, for example, and uh, I look at the oldest um, uh, available books that we have, right. uh, whether they are complete or not, or if we take the, the Iliad, or if we take the ancient uh, Greek books that form a, a sort of a foundation of mm-hmm. uh, of literature over thousands of years, we we see that uh, Western literature. Western, okay, Western. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> right. I'm sorry. Yes, nice correction yeah. of Western literature. Uh, we would see that. Um, I mean, we, we would consider them well written and well organized uh, mm-hmm. because they were done deliberately by standards that we very much respect today and uh, correct very much, very respect, much uh, you know, again by Western today, standards. by Western standards today. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we compare the Quran, for example, to that, we would not say, okay, this book was uh, organized with the same ideas and the same intentions, and the same not understandings of okay, yeah, not at all. But, and yeah. that's one of the that, that's one of the challenges we have in teaching the Quran in Western mm-hmm. universities. Spe- stu- students don't get it. Mm-hmm. They are not used to this kind of arrangement. Mm-hmm. You can't tell someone uh, there, there's a, a wonderful um, uh, article when I when I do the uh, literature class uh, on speaking of standards of literature, Western literature and and Arabic literature. Uh, the author talks about uh, saliva, how the Arab poet always loves to taste the saliva of his beloved. <laughs> That's gross in yeah. in Western standards. You don't have this kind of metaphor, mm-hmm. but Arab poets love that. This is the standards. The standards of beauty for an Arab woman in poetry is a plum woman. They don't like skinny women. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's plum woman who's well fed, who's lazy, okay, who's just waiting in the in the tent, not working. That's the standards. They don't they didn't like working women. It means that they didn't come from good families. Oh. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so a good woman who comes from a noble uh, clan or noble tribe, she's plum, she's well fed. That's the standards. So standards, so it's 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 really uh, uh, I don't want to say difficult, but it's uh, it's 
it leads you to different results when you are trying to compare a work from just not Western, same with Chinese standards. Mm-hmm. I mean, Chinese literature, again, is another beast or East, mm-hmm. East Asian. They have different standards for, for poetry and, and religious texts than the Middle East and the West. Um, yeah, well, one example that I can bring up myself, um, the, the Tao Te Ching is considered one of the most respectable books uh, in human history. And I mm-hmm. read it myself, and it's very impressive in the knowledge that it gives. But if you read the book through, it's like by, by Western standards, it's a very strangely organized book, yes, for example. Yes. Uh, even <laughs> I, I remember my, my friend, he always has a funny uh, comment on Chinese paintings. Mm-hmm. Okay, and we know that the Chinese are very good at handcraft and painting, but he compares it, he's comparing it to medieval Italian art. And he said, look, we have this, he's speaking as, as a Western, uh, but the Chinese is always a bird on a branch. Mm-hmm. It's always the same bird on a branch in, <laughs> in many, you know? Um, uh, so you see how his Western mind is thinking, but the Chinese doesn't think this way. It's every bird on a branch in a different portrait is different from another bird on another branch. It tells a different story. <laughs> But for Western art perspective, the same with Arabic art perspective. Arabs mm-hmm. didn't uh, go into paintings and uh, yeah. sculpting. They went into calligraphy and architecture, uh, whether it's theological, for theological reasons or not, but it's they have different aesthetics. Mm-hmm. And same goes with the Quran and with literature. It's just different aesthetics. Uh, uh, verses, separate verses from from chapters. You only need to know the verses separate from their context. Uh, same with poetry. You you of course you have you you can memorize a whole poem, but it's enough. Sometimes, if you want to cite an example, you just take one line or two lines out of context and then use it. It's the diff- It's a different way how the how how the mind works from one culture to another. So I I, I really have a question that I'm tempted to ask right now. I think I, I know we are through the questions and all that. Sure, but, sure. Yeah. Uh, I don't even know. Um, we basically talked about this, but uh, does it make sense to assert that the Quran is a book of universal? Um, that the Quran is a universal book. I don't know. I don't even know how to how to ask the question. But you know what I mean. That uh... I mean that it's sent to it. it uh, we can use it everywhere, anytime. Uh, it's sent for for everyone. That's what what it says. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I I, I can't. Uh form the question to make it sense in the best way right now but yeah. that the quran is is uh it would would be considered universally uh authoritative and uh valuable and again see the the devil is in the details so this is uh-huh. why we like definitions right uh-huh. Uh-huh. i mean even even when muslim scholars are trying to talk about the quran they first define the quran because mm-hmm. you can define it in so many different ways we think that oh this is the book that you can buy from the from the shelf on a bookstore but in theological terms it has a very different definition Mm -hmm. same with the universal so what what do we mean by universal is it that the laws are applicable uh everywhere but we know that even from islamic history that's not the case because even within islamdom if you say we have different legal schools, and each school follows customs in their region. So Within the people the same in Iraq lens, were yeah. following, I don't want to say completely different laws from North Africa, but they had very significant differences mm-hmm. in applicability of laws. Mm-hmm. So is it universally in terms of laws, in terms of, I don't know, theology, monotheism? Um, I don't know. So if you give me a, uh, a checklist... <laughs> what do we mean by universal? We can, at least I can talk about it from the perspective of theologians, how they thought about it. I'm yeah. fascinated by the discussion. I'm, I really, I really love it. Thank you so much. I really enjoy this. You're uh, welcome. No, no, my, my pleasure. Uh, hopefully um, I didn't digress much. And, uh, no, it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was beautiful. It was brilliant. Uh, cool. I would, I would love to have uh, more discussions with you. I believe you, um, you, you, 
uh, have uh, authority on uh, in terms of Near Eastern studies, in terms of uh, Islamic civilization, Islamic early Islamic history. Allegedly, yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Uh, I, I, I bet we could have further conversations. We can probably follow up with that. But um, sure. yeah. I would love to. I would love to have you back sometime. Yeah, and, no problem. And so uh, I'm, I, I would, I'm happy always to 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 talk with people, answer questions to the best of my ability, and mm -hmm. uh, explain things. And uh, no problem. When when I uh, come back from uh, from my leave, go back to my headquarters. I'm always happy to uh, to continue the conversation. No problem at all. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, yeah. Doctor Shadi Nasser. Uh, is there anything else that you want to add before? No, that's all. Take care and hopefully it works out and uh, good luck with everything. If you have questions about you know, these things or other things, uh, feel free to uh, be in touch. So Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks everybody for uh, watching. Uh, see you again soon and have a fantastic day. Bye. Yes, cheers. Bye-bye.